People think of it as dirty information somehow, that the money conversation is dirty and shouldn't be had in public. And what that leads to is ignorance. And what the ignorance leads to is a lack of financial success, which is really detrimental to the entire field. Welcome to Back to the Future podcast. My name is Victor Sadia, and I talk with brilliant minds and hearts of people who want to uproot and transform the current health and wellness paradigm. Dori Clark is a keynote speaker and teaches executive education at Columbia Business School. She is also the best-selling author of The Long Game, Entrepreneurial You, Reinventing You and Stand Out. A former presidential campaign spokeswoman, she writes frequently for the Harvard Business Review. In this episode, we dive into the complexities of balancing creativity, commerce, and personal reinvention. We explore the importance of creating white space, those necessary pauses for reflection and execution in our busy lives. We discuss how society often stigmatizes conversation about money, leading to ignorance and limiting financial success, particularly in creative fields. We reflect on how we as professionals can find smarter ways to leverage our skills for both creative and financial growth. Our conversation touches on the value of self-worth, long-term thinking, and how the evolving past pandemic landscape has reshaped the way we connect, work, and find meaning. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Today we have Dory Clark. Dory, thank you so much for being here. Victor, thank you. I'm delighted to talk with you. So you've talked about uh, the necessity of creating white space, not, not only in our individual agendas, but also on the socio-political agendas to really slow down, to think about uh, who we are and what we're heading. And I think a, co a podcast conversation such as this one, where we are taking out our distractions and mobile phones and everything is some sort of white space for that philosophy to happen. What do you think? I, I love it. I think that's so true. I mean, for me, um, I'm a big podcast listener myself, as well as uh, sometimes being a guest on them. And I I really love it because it, for me, it's, it's such a great experience because usually what I'm doing is taking a long walk while I'm listening. And so... I mean, I, I suppose someone could argue, oh, you should just be out in nature. Or you should just be out and, you know, thinking and not listening to something. Uh, and, you know, wh whatever people can argue. But for me, I think it's just a very pure experience because you're able to be moving your body and exercising your mind and you're not co constantly shifting your attention to something else. You know, I'm not checking messages or scrolling or whatever. I'm sort of focused and immersed in the conversation that's happening. So for me, it actually is kind of a immersive flow state activity to listen to a really good conversation. Yeah, I love this word you use that it's a pure thing because yes, you can be walking in nature in, in the purest, simplest way, but yeah, your mind will be racing all over the place and using others' conversation as scaffolds for your own uh, thought processes is a big thing. It's like, in a sense, you're reading a book, but also you are talking with the book. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so in that sense, Let's talk about this white space, like philosophically. M much of the things that we are encountering today, the, the big crisis of today, uh, I don't know, the environment, uh, health, the discrepancy between rich and poor, war, uh, plastics, whatever. I I arguably, all these problems are coming because we've been accelerating the pace of civilization. And in times of urgency like this one, we need to slow down, right? That sounds so obvious. But let's go deeper. What would it take to really try and, and do that? Well, I, I think that it's worth taking a step back to try to understand why white space, uh, you know, meaning un unscheduled or unstructured time is so important. And I think that there's a couple of reasons. One is that if you don't have any white space, if literally everything is just schedule, 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 back to back, you actually don't have any time for execution. And so whatever the thing is you've decided to do, it might be nice, you know, you made a good decision, but then you actually never do it <laughs> because you don't have time to do it. And so it becomes uh, just hypothetical and, and nothing ever really moves forward because no one has time to implement what's been decided. So obviously there's a, a problem there. The second reason is that if you are going 
all the time and just in execution mode, you don't have time to step back and actually inquire whether the things you are doing, you know, the meetings you are having, the calls you're having, whatever, are the right things to be doing. You are so focused on accomplishing the thing in front of you to get through the day, you can't ask bigger picture questions or prioritize. And you may discover if you do take a step back, that the things you've been so methodically spending your time on actually are not worth doing, which is a little bit of a depressing realization. And that's part of why I think in some cases people shy away from asking those questions, but they are nonetheless important questions to be asking. What what would it mean for us as a society, as a, as a, as a community to legitimize uh, this white space for everyone? You know, not, not, not only for or outliers like us that we understand the power of, of doing so in our personal agendas, but the collective agenda. What would it take? What would be the big cost of going that way? Yeah, I mean, obviously it is, um, you know, th there's a rationale, there's a reason why society has come to the place that it has, which is it makes sense up to a point to have people be as efficient as they possibly can you know do do more do more do more uh is very compelling because you're creating more products you're building more widgets you know whatever it is and that seems like a really good idea the question though is always what is the tipping point uh because someone being able to make more widgets faster is definitely a great thing unless you reach the point where they are going so fast that they become careless, that they make mistakes, and the system breaks down because what they're producing is actually less good and less worthwhile than if they were making fewer but better. And so, you know, it's very easy to visualize with physical products or physical labor. It's a little bit more tricky or conceptual when we're thinking about what it's like for knowledge workers, but you can imagine uh, a scenario where somebody is just burning themselves out so much, they just don't have a lot of firepower left. You know, they might have been able to come up with a brilliant idea three hours ago, but if they've been working all night long and they haven't eaten dinner and their back is aching because they've been sitting at a desk, they're probably not going to have the, uh, the amazing breakthrough idea right then. And so we have to really get thoughtful about how we're threading the needle uh, for ourselves, for our businesses, for society to understand that, yes, you know, more output and more productivity is a great thing, but not so much so that the entire enterprise crumbles. Yeah. And and I believe that part of the big problems that we have is, is just that, that, you know, we, we've so, we've been so obsessed with this uh, pace that, you know, we have created our own problems, our own crisis, our own contradictions. And now the system needs some sort of, I don't know, re restructuring in a sense. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and you're an expert in in uh, in self reinvention. Uh, uh, but what happens when the expert in self reinvention reinvents itself or, or herself? Uh, are 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 you still an expert? <laughs> <laughs> you know that's that's a very uh, that's a very philosophical question. One of my precepts is that I try to never personally call myself uh, an expert. Anyway, I feel like that's the rabbit hole to down to uh, self aggrandizement. So I think it's a great compliment when other people call you an expert, but I recommend for, for most people that they do not call themselves an expert. <laughs> like, let, you know, let's, let's let the world make a judgment about that instead. Uh, but I, I definitely am trying to stretch my horizons. Um, about eight years ago, I started writing musical theater and uh, I do a lot of work with that. Uh, that's an area where I've been developing expertise. And uh, this year, I actually have been working on writing a memoir, which is something that I've never done before. So a uh, totally different type of work. Uh, so hopefully I can get that published at some point. Uh, so I'm, I'm flexing the muscles too. How, how about you, Victor? What, what, is, uh, what does reinvention look like in your world? Thank you for the question. Um, and I think in that way, we're kind of similar because for me, self-reinvention is just the, the opportunity to not fix my identity to a specific profession or task or goal, right? So in that sense, if, if we are allowed to keep adding things to our busy schedules in terms of art, uh, uh, work, family, reflection, uh, having fun, whatever, um, that's, that's the process of self-reinvention where you are not the same robot uh, walking through life. 
right? Forever doing the same things. And in that sense, I know that you're also in the, in the world of personal branding and your personal brand. And my struggle is to, in a sense, put my brand in, in a place where people can understand what I do so that they can hire me and, 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 and talk to me. But at the same time, it's like, I don't want to be forever the person who does that. And I want that my brand evolves in a sense that I want to reinvent myself every five minutes if I want. And that should be also an attractive things for people. But I, I don't think we see much of that in the influencer personal branding world. W what do you think? Yeah, I think it's a, a really interesting point um, because we do as individuals get very wedded to our identities and to the status that comes with our identity. It, it feels nice to feel like, oh, I know everything that a person needs to know about this subject. It's, it's a very safe zone and you get a lot of respect from other people from it. So it's appealing for those reasons. Um, it's also true, I think, sometimes that if you have become, a, you know, recognized for your expertise in a certain area, sometimes you might veer into a direction if it's new that other people are less interested in following you into. And so your your audience that you've become accustomed to sort of drops off. I mean, there's a guy that I know that's a very accomplished business thinker, and he's also very into spirituality. And so he started, like he did a like a workshop where it was going to be about spirituality, and uh, he ended up needing to cancel it because not enough people registered because everyone's like, uh, that's not what we came for here. Uh, so you you do you i mean there is some risk in the sense that you will retain some of your audience but not all of your audience um you know if you're doing it right you'll probably gain a new audience as well but uh you have to recognize that there is uh turnover in some ways yeah i love that you're saying that there's a risk involved it's not that you can you can win everything and at the same time i think over time, I, I would hope that people would recognize that because everyone, I think, would love to not be pinched to a specific identity. So when they see others doing so, they might also be open to the idea that others doing it, it's not so bad and they can also follow them in those adventures and risk-taking things. But also on the individual side, and I think it's that this is true for you, is that the audience does not follow you. You you, you're still very happy, right? You are doing what you love. Uh, and that I think that's the seed of creativity and productivity even. Yeah, I think that's right. And and of course, you know, this is an old problem, right? Uh, this is what every rock musician faces. You know, the, they've got the fans and they say, oh, but, but I liked your first album. You know, why did you get so experimental in the second album? And, uh, you know, meanwhile, the, the rocker wants to stretch and grow and do their tribute to Miles Davis or something that's not terribly commercial. And the fans just want to hold up their lighters and be like, sing Freebird. Uh, so we, we all have to deal with this tension. Yeah. It, how have you dealt with this uh, when they when they are asking you for your first album and you are pushing for your third or fourth album? How, how do you deal with this? So I think for me, one of the things that I have done in some ways is in my business writing, I've done four sort of business and career books. The good news is that in most cases, the, the topics are different, but they're all roughly interesting to the same audience. So um, I, I think that that in a lot of ways, I was able to keep my audience interested or, or engaged because it's all facets of things that someone who is is in that mode of, you know, they're an entrepreneur or they're a HR talent professional or something like that. It's the kind of stuff that they would like. But it's, it's also true that I, you know, for something that's really far afield, like musical theater, not everybody likes that, you know, that's, that's fine. Uh, it is a, it is a separate thing, a separate topic. And so, so I just recognize that when I talk about it, I talk about it a little bit because I think that that lends a little bit of color to what I do. It helps people feel like they know me better or maybe they just find it interesting like, oh, hey, here's a person doing a creative thing. But I'm certainly not going to take my business email list and suddenly make it 100% about musical theater. Like that would bore people, that would alienate people. You have to always recognize and respect what people came for. Uh, you know, I, I like a little bit of color too. I mean, if you were like really interested in birding or something, I mean, you know, I could, I could give a crap about birds. But uh, if you liked birding and you were able to talk about it and make it uh, compelling in some way, I'd be glad occasionally to hear about your birding adventures. I just don't want to hear about your birding adventures all the time.
Yeah, I love that. And I think this this really is about a a, a life long problem, even a, a very ancestral thing, which is like the separation between business and art, right? Of doing what you love or doing what you need to do so that you can uh, earn your 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 wage or whatever. And it's difficult to maintain the paradox and the contradiction and the ambiguity of of living with both things. We we tend either to take the business side and say, well, this is just how it is and let's be productive and, and, and very efficient or the artistic side which is no we we let's just play and be creative and and, and and money doesn't matter and I think both perspectives are a bit off right are a bit false in a sense uh, but nevertheless the tension won't resolve itself you have to live through it and and and, and just be very transparent and I think about it I, I think that that's really appreciated by by the people who follow you yeah thank you and I, I think you're right Victor to point out the kind of contradictions or the perceived contradictions that people have I mean I think I think we often do ourselves a disservice right I mean I a couple of days ago I was at a, a kind of kickoff event for a, a musical theater, uh, group, I guess you could say that I'm, I'm part of. And I was in the elevator with a group going up to the meeting. And these were people that were going to the same meeting, but I had never met them before. And so someone's making small talk. And we were in the elevator of this very fancy New York office building, you know, a lot of, you know, high powered companies were in this building. And so she kind of looks around and all the musical theater people are looking very scruffy. And she said, Oh, you know, I think I think we, you know, we just brought down the average income uh, in this in this building, you know, like by 50% or something like that. And she's, you know, making a joke. And then another another woman piles on and she says, Oh, you know, my cousin works in this building. And, you know, he wanted to get together one time. But you know, I'm like, I don't know, because I'm like, what would I talk about with a business person? Person. And, you know, I mean, these are tropes that you hear all the time from artists. And honestly, maybe it's a way of people making themselves feel better about not making a lot of money. Uh, and, you know, it's not like crazy harmful, but, you know, I, I hear stuff like that. And it's like, you know, it's actually a good thing to want to make money. It's actually a good thing to make money. I think that it it, it just to me is a form of really uh, depressed self-justification for artists to kind of amp up their perceived self-nobility uh, to be like, oh, well, what would I talk about with my boring cousin who wears a suit anyway? You know what? Your boring cousin who works at, you know, in marketing is actually probably not that boring. He's probably really interesting. And he might actually have ideas about marketing your show so that you could have money too. <laughs> like, I, I think that uh, the, the poles that people erect between art and commerce are so uh, false and so self-justifying. I mean, it's it's true. Oftentimes, art does not make a lot of money, but it doesn't mean that it inherently doesn't. Uh, I think that there's th ways that we can be smarter and creative about it. And I think that whether or not you're making money from your art, there are really smart ways that artists can leverage their skills so that they can become very financially successful. And I would much rather live in a world, encourage a world where artists say, you know what? I want to make a lot of money too. How can I be smart about it and work around the constraints so that I can figure out a way to make as much money as my cousin who works in marketing rather than just saying, oh, he's a tool. I don't know what I'd say to him. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And um, I would love to see that too, right? Because at the end of the day, we do need those artistic, free-spirited, uh, creative, very sensitive people uh, trying to to impact the world in, from that sensitivity, right? We we need that. We, we sometimes I sometimes believe that the world is, you know, it's too fast in a sense that we cannot really savor music and and touch and sculpture and and creativity. And but yeah, I, uh, you know, that's 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 a big thing. So in terms of sociolo a sociological approach, I would love to legitimize the fact that art can be I wouldn't say a commodity but certainly something that flows through the magma of financial interchanges. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that for me, what is a very valuable thing that even, even at a structural level, it's really a challenge. So this musical theater program that I'm part of, it's it's great. I have nothing but you know good good things to say about it and I'm grateful for it, but they have made a really deliberate choice that literally all they do, all they cover is the craft. And every week you get together and you learn how to be better at your craft. 
that is really nice. But what it means is that there are a lot of people that are excellent craftsmen that have no idea how to get their shows produced. Just absolutely no idea. And, it, you know, it means that, I don't know, if somebody taps them on the shoulder at the shopping mall and says, hey, can you write a great musical theater piece for me? Then, you know, they're ready. <laughs> but how likely is it that they're going to be discovered in that fashion? And instead... I mean, this this is part of what animates all of my work, because it's not just true in the artistic world. It's, it's honestly true in parts of the business world as well. There are a lot of things that are secret. There are a lot of things that don't get talked about. You know, in the business world, it's sort of the equivalent of like, how do you get published in high profile publications? How do you get tapped to be a speaker at a very prominent conference? How do you get to be the person that gets promoted really quickly as compared to your colleagues? You know, all these kinds of things. There are answers. Other people have done it before, but they don't really talk about it. Um, in some cases, out of a sense of politeness, in some cases, because they actually actively want to hide the information so that they can hoard it. And in the art world, it might be, well, how do you get a reading? How do you get a show produced? Uh, how do you land a producer or do self-funding and do fundraising? You know, whatever it is. But there are a lot of things where there's extremely useful information that could actually make success much more attainable for people. And yet, it doesn't get talked about by the schools and by the institutions. And as a result, it be, it gets a taint. People think of it as dirty information somehow, that, that the money conversation is dirty and shouldn't be had in public. And what that leads to is ignorance. And what the ignorance leads to is a lack of financial success, which is really detrimental to the entire field. Well, I love this. Um, I'm organizing a conference next month on lifestyle medicine with a lot of health professionals. And I, I'm moderating a panel to talk about our relationship with money as health professionals. And initially, I was very hesitant to do so because I didn't want to be very frivolous or the dirty talk of money in health. And then one of the panelists said, listen, this is the most needed and legitimate thing to do. These people need to learn how to make money because they are spreading health. You're right. This is, they, they should be rich because if they are rich, it means they have impacted millions of people. And it's, it's it just show how this uh, pervasive, dirty money conversation uh, really just exacerbates the problem that we are attempting to, to try to solve just because that belief is so entrenched in our culture. Yeah, that's right on, Victor. I, I, I think it's great that you're doing it because the truth is some people are having conversations about money and about how do you earn more money and how do you put yourself in the path for success like that. But the people who are probably having those conversations are the people who either already have money or they're the people who are connected to them. And so that is the definition of the replication of an old boys network. And if, if someone is actually serious about wanting to democratize access to information and democratize opportunity, then you can't just have a system where a guy at the country club tells his friend at the country club how he got that BMW. <laughs> you need to have information much more widely available so that the people with the best ideas can actualize them and financialize them uh, rather than just the people who have access to a kind of secret know-how. Yeah, that's spot on. And I think it is our job to also leave a trace, whatever your career is, even if with this approach of being multidisciplinary, not to just show when you got to the top and you got your book published, but also the whole process, not only of how did you market yourself so that you were relevant to the market, but your philosophical and existential beliefs that you have to fight against in your own body, in your own psyche, in your own emotions, and even in your own, you know, this, um, you know, you might even get physically ill when dealing with these beliefs and show that path. Because at the end of the day, that's, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's the path. Right? Yeah, 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 it's it's so it's so true. I mean, I think you're right to put your finger on limiting beliefs as being something that is really important to think about and to acknowledge. I mean, I was uh out a couple of nights ago with somebody who is very enmeshed in the arts space and he was, you know, I, I raised the question because his sort of day job had changed. And uh, I raised the question about whether he was planning to do some consulting. And he sort of bristled a little bit. And he's like, oh, I just think that, you know, consultants, just so many of them are just bullshitters and that they get so much money for what they do. And it's not justified. And it's just about, you know, selling things and putting something over on people. And, you know, I mean, of course, as, as they say, right, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, you know, this is this is not the mindset of someone who's going to be an incredibly successful consultant, uh, since he clearly thinks that consultants are charlatans. And I, I, you know, nonetheless, he is someone who has a lot of talent and a lot of specialized skills. And if he actually did want to become a consultant, he probably could do a good job and be successful at it. Um, the real question is a mental one of, do you feel convinced that you are worth the price that someone would pay? And, you know, it, it's it's interesting because we get these implicit frames in our head. You know, you're, you get used to doing work for X dollars an hour uh, or X pesos. And uh, all of a sudden, if you hear about someone who's doing things and they're getting 10 times more or 100 times more, there's two ways that you can approach that. One is, you know, that person's a criminal. <laughs> what are they doing? They're doing something immoral. Or the other way is to get curious and say, what are they doing? And how can I do that too? And I would really love it for more people to get curious because um, it's it's really remarkable how much, um, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, we have the asterisk that there are plenty of people that have not had advantages of education or things like that. And, and these paths are not accessible to them. But assuming that you are a professional that has, you know, a decent baseline of education, it is likely that there are ways that you probably could tap into new opportunities that other people with your same skills or less have been able to if you open your mind to really understanding and analyzing how they did it. Beautiful. And um, I, I see myself reflected in all the things that you're saying in that, you know, if, if I'm about, if I'm to show what 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 is this internal struggle and, and show that I've also been sarcastic about the other people who are more successful or I've been uh, saying that money is dirty or I've been saying that, yeah, I'm also waiting to be discovered. So I'm writing and writing and someday a magic wand will appear and take me to the New York Times, right? Um, and I think it's, um, uh, so spot on. I would love to tie it back to the long-term thinking that you uh, talked much about. Um, and, and how is it for you? Because you have this, this beautiful phrase that says, strong convictions lightly held, right? What is what it is for, for you, not only the things that you'll do in the long term, but that you want to be in the long term, uh, that you use this phrase for? In, in your current Dory Clark's impersonation identity of today. Yeah, thank you. So so that is a phrase that um, is popular in Silicon Valley. And I, I, I do find it quite helpful as we think about our own lives and careers. So strong convictions lightly held. And basically, you know, what it means is that you do need to have a, a thesis. You do need to have a, an idea that you are sort of marching toward okay, I think that I want to have a career in finance, or I think that I want to live in Paris, or whatever it is. And that's great, because, you know, you you need to have a goal of some kind, otherwise you're not going to make any progress whatsoever. But it's also true that if you are thoughtful about it, you may at some point come across disconfirming evidence. And if it turns out that you think you want a job in finance, but you do informational interviews with half a dozen people who work work in finance, and they all hate their jobs. And what they describe to you as their day-to-day -day life is something that you think would be terrible and doesn't relate to your interests at all. You know, it's not a good idea to continue pursuing a path just because you said that's what you wanted to do. You can um, be, you know, light enough to say, you know what, I got new evidence, I will change my mind. This is, this is not being flighty or flaky. This is being the kind of rational citizen that I think most of us would want, which is if the facts change, it's okay for your opinion to change. Right. And 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 what would be your strong convictions for, for your being in the long-term game? Yeah. So, you know, for me, I'll, I'll give you an example of something that I actually did change and then something that is still uh, operative so far. So something that did change was probably, you know, 15, 20 years ago, something that, that I thought would be really cool. Uh, and for, for a long time, I had had this as a fantasy is I thought, you know, I would really like to be a college president. That would be a very cool sort of grown up capstone career. Now, 
it's not a career that young people really have. You know, you don't you don't see a lot of 25 year old college presidents. It's not a thing. So I I had, you know, ever since I was in college, I thought, oh, that would be so cool. You live, first of all, you live in this beautiful house. Uh, second of all, you get to be part of a, you know, the college community. It's a community of learning. You're always bringing in cool speakers. You have your colleagues are interesting, smart faculty members. You know, you're you're really um in a world of learning. And I thought that sounded great. So for a long time, I'm like, you know what, when I'm like 50 or something like that, like that's a job I'd like, that would be cool. So I started kind of marching toward it in certain ways. So I began doing university teaching. Uh, I did undergrad teaching. I did graduate teaching. I even got a um, got appointed to a seat on a college board so that I could really understand it. So, you know, I'm kind of gathering, I mean, they're non-traditional credentials. I mean, most people who become college presidents are full-time tenured academics who get promoted. That's not a path that I had, but I was getting enough credentials that you could kind of marshal a case that I could be a college president. And then, you know, uh, a few years ago, I would say somewhere between five and 10 years ago, I began to realize that the tenor of campus life had changed from the time when I was in school. Uh, and, you know, when I was in school, there was frankly just very little um, external societal debate about the value of universities. Universities were considered almost universally to be a great place, a great thing. We're educating people. Um, it was, it was very valuable. And more recently, uh, there's not only been a lot of questioning about should we have universities? Is it worth it? But also, uh, you know, certainly in the United States, um, over, over the past couple of years, it's become this incredibly contentious place politically. It, you know, presidents are kind of in the middle of it. So many of them are resigning because this one was too hard on protesters and this one was too soft on protesters. It just seems like a no-win kind of job. And so uh, a number of years ago, as a result of things like that, I realized, you know, that actually sounds these days like a terrible job. I don't want that job anymore. And so it had been a strong conviction, but when I was uh, when I was presented with new evidence, I decided no, that's not that's not actually what I want to do. So uh, I have backed off from that and changed my ambitions. But I do still have another longer term ambition, which was something that, in my mind, the career of my fifties would have been being a college president. The career of my sixties, which I still am interested in, is being a United States ambassador. Uh, how to figure out how to get there? This is very tricky. I don't quite know, uh, but it is still my provisional goal. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing and put, putting putting into words and, and getting us uh, the permission to record those words today. Um, and, and that's the beauty also of knowledge workers, right? That probably 20 years ago when you were in college, didn't know that that was a potential profession. But now you are surrounded by colleagues who are in producing knowledge and sharing ideas and traveling all over the world. And you've been invited to, to so many um, conferences um, uh, over the past years that I would like to talk to, about uh, the future of those events. Because I, I sometimes believe, and this is not me trying to put the answer into the question. I'm just giving you my opinion and then you can give me your answer. Um, but basically what I'm seeing in the conferences is that it's too much ideas, intellectual uh, material flowing that we don't have enough time and space to really um, absorb it and integrate it. And for me, these conferences have become more like a show that you have, you are very fun because you're overly stimulated, but not as a transformational experience. How do you characterize the public speaking of today? And where do you think it will evolve in the future? Because that's no, that's going nowhere. Like it will keep, it will keep growing. Yeah, I think you raise a really interesting point, Victor. I mean, for me, something that has changed fairly substantially when it comes to the conference industry is the rise of hybrid and remote work. Because it used to be, you know, I mean, conferences were always kind of this, you know, hey, it's fun. It's a pretty location. We're all going to get together. We're going to hear some speakers. We're going to uh, learn some things. But now conferences are actually so vitally important in the sense that because so many people are operating virtually, uh, you know, post pandemic, there was debate about whether people would go back 
to the office or not. And by and large, um, they mostly haven't. Um, we, we are operating in a really changed landscape, uh, at least with certain industries. And so as a result, conferences and ways for people to gather in person have become enormously more important. Um, this is the lifeline that people don't don't really have. You know, it, it becomes a very, very special thing. Before it was always nice, it was it was fun, but now it is really from an educational, but also from an emotional perspective, a connectivity perspective, a really uh critical activity for um for people in an industry or in an organization. And so I think that what that implies is, number one, there probably needs to be much more time and also much more thought given to how people can connect with one another. Networking is really hard now that there's not offices. And so I think that it's no longer, I mean, if it ever was, uh, it's no longer a good idea to just pack things with, you know, oh, here's 10 hours of speakers, right? What people are coming for is not to obtain information. You can get that from the web. What they want is connection to other people. And it's useful to have some speakers and some information because that gives them something to talk about and it gives it kind of a theme for the gathering, but you don't want to inundate people. You want to mostly be creating a context in which they can build relationships. That that would be my sort of quick perspective. Uh, uh, beautiful. And, and, and what are some examples of, of nice experiences that, that, that you had in the networking arena that really made you feel comfortable, uh, at ease, even when you are an introvert, uh, or a, a, at least that's one of the ways you, 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 you think about yourself, uh, and has given you the opportunity to connect in a more deeper way than just trading uh, business cards? Well, I have a, a couple of answers to that. I mean, one is that I I have my own very definite opinions about these things. Uh, I've written a number of articles for the Harvard Business Review about how to structure like sort of small networking dinners, uh, which is a thing that I often like to do. And for me, a, a lot of it is about providing an excess of information so that people feel really comfortable. Like, I think the worst thing is just being thrown in and it's like, okay, here's a bunch of people. I don't know anything about them. Okay, I'm just gonna guess. <laughs> it's very stressful. But if you have a dinner gathering, and for instance, if you send out an email in advance, letting people know who's going to be there, sharing a little bit of bio. It gives people a chance to think, oh, I really want to meet Victor. I really want to ask Victor about blah, blah, blah. And it lets them prepare and kind of, you know, get more out of the endeavor. Another thing, I mean, I want to give a hat tip to my friend Nick Gray, who has uh, thought about this and written about this a lot. He wrote a book called The, the Two-Hour Cocktail Party, and uh, he has a, a really great sort of formula for how to organize an event. And this is true if you're a person. It's true if you're a company. You can do this a really nice, uh, easy way to help bring people together. And he's a fan of just really basic things. Um The lowest hanging fruit is have name tags. Uh, a lot of times people say that they don't want them. They resist. They're like, oh, it feels weird. It's stupid. I don't like having a name tag. But it makes it so much easier for everybody else. And frankly, it makes it easier for you too because you might see someone that you kind of remember, but yeah, what was it? You know, was it, was it Victor? Was it Vincent? Eh. And then like, I'm afraid to talk to you because I can't quite remember. A name tag takes care of that. It helps drill it into your head. Um, even just small gestures of thoughtfulness like that make it a lot easier. What would you say is the role of, of vulnerability in those settings that, that sharing Uh, deeper, more vulnerable parts of yourself in order to really invite more empathy and and basically also in the in the networking events it's uh, sometimes it's a lot of show off right and this and that and that and and and, and just walking around with your CV uh, uh, in front of you um, yeah what would you say about that yeah I mean it's it's true um, I think it's important to note that some people you know, we'll just sort of universally say like, I hate small talk. And I mean, of course, like basically everyone hates small talk, but there is a role for small talk in the sense that that is the way you get a conversation warmed up, right? Like you can't just immediately go in and be like, so Victor, what's your greatest fear in life? <laughs> you know, that's not, that's not going to work too well. You need to start with something. And the, something is, you know, gosh, Victor, have you been to this conference before? You know, you just, something but it but it gets it going it starts the the engagement but it's also true 
that ideally you want to try as quickly as you can to get to something more substantive. And so that is, you know, looking for commonalities or yes, it could be some kind of uh, self-disclosure. I mean, I think like a lot of things, um, you know, I'm sure there's people who are like going to misconstrue something and they'll be like, oh, great. I'll just, I'll just open the vein right here and uh, say something. And, you know, you, you don't want it to be so vulnerable that people are like, oh God, I wish he hadn't said that. <laughs> but, uh, but it's also true that if there there is a space where it's natural and comfortable for disclosure, um, then, you know, I think that that's perfectly reasonable. I mean, if you're talking with someone and, um, you know, they're like, you know, let's say they, you know, you know them a little bit, they've met your wife and your wife isn't there, they say, where's Brenda? Y you know, you could say, oh, uh, she's busy, ha ha ha. Or you could, if it's true, you could say, actually, we we got divorced. <laughs> and that's a little awkward. But number one, uh, if it's true, it's just like, good, you don't have to worry about like the stress of concealing something. But then the person can actually have a real conversation with you. They can be like, oh, God, you know, how long ago was it? I got divorced, too. That's really tough. You know, how? Oh, do you? didn't you have a dog? How are you handling dog custody? And then you can get into an actual real person conversation. I get a sense that you enjoy uh, being by yourself much, right? You like being, be, be, you like talking. To <laughs> what, you. what vibe am I sending, Victor? <laughs> Which is a great vibe because I, I think that in order for us to be socially, uh, uh, you know, engaging and energetic and, and very present, it's just these moments of recurrent reflection and, and per personal love in a sense. Ah, well, thank you. I appreciate it. It, it is true. I am, uh, I definitely identify as an introvert. So I like, I like my time to, uh, to chill out, to recharge, uh, to be at the gym or get a massage or take a long walk or something like that, because I, you know, it's, it's fun to be with people, but, you know, ultimately the, um, the sort of frame for introversion and extroversion, it's its actually uh, typically related to your genetic capacity for how much stimulation you can take, essentially. And if you're an introvert, uh, you get overstimulated more easily. And so you need to find a way to like, okay, that's great. Good. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to go chill out now. Uh, and as long as you're aware of your predilections and can kind of balance your energy, then you can be a successful social person. You just need to do it in doses. Beautiful. I, I, I relate to that. And, and talking about massages, you know, this, this moment when you're about to, to fall asleep in, at night or waking up in the morning where you're, you know, beta, gamma waves in the brain, you know, that, 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 that spot where you are, you get beautiful ideas. Does that happen to you? during massages because I sometimes cannot relax in massage because that's when I'm, I'm kind of relaxed and, and hitting that spot of creativity. Do you write and, and think about a lot of good ideas while lying you know, there? Sometimes I do. Yeah. I, I, I will, um, I want to desperately like not forget them. So sometimes the latter part of a massage, I'll be like, okay, write, write down A and B and C like, okay. Like I'll, I'll sort of be quizzing myself so that I don't forget it when it's, uh, when it's over so that I can capture the ideas that have come up. Yeah. Yeah. I do the same in the shower. And I do acronyms, just remembering the first letter of the word so that I can later <laughs> write them Good plan. Down. Yeah. All right, Dory. Well, thank you so much for this uh, beautiful conversation. I, I applaud your work, but most of all, your, your integrity on how you approach it. It's very inspiring. And this conversation was, uh, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you so much. Victor, thank you. What a joy to speak with you. I appreciate it. You have a great day, Dory. Thank you. You too.